evening. Uh, let's begin. I'm Margot Amory, and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of the Lake Worth Interfaith Network to this Zoom event honoring the great Rosa Parks. And uh, we are honoring her today because this is the 65th anniversary of her historic act of civil disobedience. So uh, the, the standard American narrative about Rosa Parks is that she was a humble seamstress going home from work and she was tired and she just spontaneously did this act. But I think if you study her a bit more deeply, you'll see that there's something missing. She was a very active civil rights participant. She was a member of the NAACP. She was secretary of the Montgomery, Alabama NAACP and an advisor to their youth. She participated in a lot of training about civil disobedience. So there is a great deal to say about her. Um, much to say, we have panelists here tonight uh, who will share their insights with us. And let me just give you an overview of how our program will unfold. I would like to introduce our panelists. And then we have a short video, just 20 minutes long, which gives a summary of the events leading up to the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott. Uh, we'll see the film. And then I have a couple of questions for our panelists. And I think they'll have some great insight for us. And finally, I'm going to ask each of our panelists just to share their personal thoughts about this anniversary and ask if they have any personal experiences related to this that they would like to share. Uh, so now let's get started. Uh, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Karen Taborn, who's with us from New York City. She is a scholar specializing in ethnomusicology, communication, and culture. She is currently co-facilitator of New York City's Morningside Quaker Meeting Racial Justice Study Group. She's a former faculty member at the Gutman Community College in Manhattan and at York College in Jamaica, Queens. And she's a Harlem Renaissance scholar of particular interest to me. Welcome, welcome, Karen. Thank you. And we have Anderson Kurtz. He is a former human resources executive and a retired small business entrepreneur. Since his retirement, he has committed to playwriting, focusing on the African-American experience. And he has a new play up his sleeve right now on the topic of James Weldon Johnson. And we're anxiously awaiting that. Uh, we have mm -hmm. Vivek Swaroop, who is a practicing Vedantic Hindu and a certified yoga instructor. Victor played a speaking part in Sir Richard Attenborough's film, Gandhi, with Ben Kingsley. He's a founding member of the Board of Trustees of the Mahatma Gandhi Square of Florida, and he's one of the founding members of Gandhi King Global Initiative at Stanford University. He's also the founder of India International Institute. And finally, we have Rhonda Rogers, who is CEO and president of Lake Worth West Resident Planning Group and the director of Bridges at Lake Worth West. She's also a member and chapter president of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women West Palm Beach chapter. And I have something special to share with you about Rhonda. Rhonda has been doing her research on Rosa Parks here you see she sent me a wonderful photo. I imagine this was taken in Montgomery. It's Rhonda standing with the Rosa Parks statue. Delightful photo. Oh, and I should also mention, finally, our other participant behind the scenes is Ted Brownstein, who is managing this Zoom event and uh, hosting it. And Ted is one of the founders of the Lake Worth Interfaith Network. Oh, Jefferson is with us now. Hi, Jefferson. Let me introduce Jefferson briefly. Jefferson Dalmar is a senior at Buffalo State College, where he's majoring in English. After graduation, he plans to attend graduate school in Florida with a career goal of working with special needs children. 
Jefferson, thank you for being here. Thank you. So, Ted, can you bring up our film? Welcome back. Are we inspired? I know I am. Panelists, any comments about this film? Karen, do you have any, any comments about the film? Any thoughts? She's got to unmute herself. There, okay. you go. there you go. I don't know. I mean, just, um, she was such a lovely woman. Um, my mother met her um, when, she, when my mother was older. And I just remember my mom coming back from the meeting and just saying, she's such a sweet woman. And she was very moved, very moved by her. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Anderson, your thoughts? Mr. Anderson, you got to unmute yourself. Unmute, Anderson. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. sir. Okay. No, I um, I initially regarded her as a strong woman, but not necessarily a hero, simply because in my growing up, um, she was just like all the Black women that raised me. And so I saw her in that light as opposed to being an icon because the women that raised me were these very, very strong women in this little town in the South that stood up for the children and for us and made us very strong people. And so when I saw Rosa Parks, I said, yeah, well, she's just like my mother, my grandmother, the other women that raised me. Mm -hmm. And then as I got older, I realized, wait a minute, this woman changed the course of the world. She changed the course of history. And that to me is an, is an awesome thing. So um, I now of course regard her as one of the real beacons, of, well, not only of black America, but of America in general. My agony though, is that somehow we tend to forget our heroes and our icons and they don't really live on forever. And uh, I think about Japanese culture Japanese culture has a, a concept of national treasures where people who do significant things are recognized and rewarded and taken care of by the culture. And that didn't happen with her. I mean, when she got to Detroit, she had to struggle and scuffle to find a job. And so John Conyers took her in and she did good things for him. But there should be a way in African-American culture that we recognize our treasures and make sure that they're valued and guarded and protected and taken care of. That is a great point. Thank you for that, Anderson. Jefferson, do you have any thoughts about the film? Uh, yes, Margaret, can you hear me well? I can. Okay, that's good. So first and foremost, I wanted to say uh, Rosa Parks, she basically set the tone for um, not conforming to the norm, to the status quo. And sometimes instead of saying yes to everything and following orders, it's okay to stand up for oneself, to combat, and to fight for what is right. Um, and that's just, and that's just, it's an everyday battle even currently today with police brutality, um, racism in the healthcare, housing, at banks when uh, black folks will try to obtain a, a loan to purchase a house or whatnot or property. So it's, it's a constant everyday battle. And instead of conforming, why not try harder to fight for, fight for yourself? And that's what I got from it so far. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Victor, your thoughts? Yes, uh, very, very inspiring. You know, um, I just recently came in, uh, you know, started uh, learning about Rosa Parks. You know, I have been involved with Gandhi and uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s but Rosa Park uh, came across as a very, you know, pleasing divine person. 
uh, but very effective. And, uh, you know, bringing a um, comparison is with the wife of uh, Gandhi, Kasturba Gandhi, who was always at his side, uh, worked with him, you know, but never got the recognition, uh, you know, like many, many uh, ladies and females uh, that have stood by with their husbands who have gained uh, recognition mm -hmm. while they sacrificed a lot. Even during um, the African movement, uh, Gandhi uh, had uh, Kasturba reached out to the women to bring women to take part in the uh, protests. So, you know, that came out very strong. And uh, another thing that came out was uh, awareness that came out was that as soon as she uh, did the boycott, there were institutions and organizations and people that embraced her. So um, just to say that she was she went into anonymity or uh, didn't get the recognition, but in the course of what she did, stood out. You know, she was part of the NAACP. Then she was also involved with the uh, uh, Highlander Folk School where she was trained in uh, civil disobedience. So yes, you know, we can, we will uh, definitely take into consideration what she did and it came out of her uh, reaction and her tra being traumatized by herself and seeing others uh, mistreated. But there were institutions, there were people like Martin Luther King Jr. who you know, orchestrated the boycott. What I'm trying to say is that it's the whole you know, ecosystem that coalesces around people who are doing good things. So, you know, that uh, needs to be recognized and, uh, you know, feel very, uh, that's a very important point that I gathered because the film that I saw, the, you know, the video that I saw was uh, indicating that a lot of people, uh, you know, the attorneys, the lawyers, the Supreme Court cases, all those things work together. They weaved the movement uh, so she's like a drop in the ocean, but the drop makes the ocean, yeah. Yeah. you know, Thank you. so the Thank individuality you. Yeah. doesn't have to be, you know, right. you know, she is there, you know, she's part of the river that's okay. flowing, you know, so, but very inspirational. Beautiful thought. Thank you. Rhonda, your thought. Yeah, just piggybacking on what Victor said. I think she's more than a drop, Victor. I think she's more of a splash in the ocean. Yeah, you know, for can, me, yeah. yeah, for me, the movie, the, the, the documentary was very emotional. Um, the beginning journey brought back all of the hard feelings and all of the, the negativity that we went through at that time, people of color, to get where they are. And just remembering that in a lot of cases, um, America was built on the backs of women and including Black women. And so they, you know, it was a lot of bumps in the road to get to where we are. And so I still feel like that is why it's so hard in this day and age to be still dealing with some of this stuff and some of the rhetoric that comes out of um, President Trump's mouth, unfortunately, that just can't be tolerated. And so that's really what it brought me to is like to see the beginning of the, the, the documentary and then moving to the end. And I hope that our journey continues to move to the end of better peace and better change. Uh, because we're all in this together. No one person is better than the other. No skin color is better than the other. And so for me, it just reminded me that not only just women, but women of color have been around and have been instrumental for a very long time. Uh, we know that voting is extremely important. It's definitely important for me. It's something that I make sure that I engage on every election and every cycle. It doesn't just mean presidents. You know, we know the president is, a, the, everybody turns out for the president election, but who's turning out for the local elections? Who's making sure that our mayors and our governors and all those people who really do make the change are, are speaking for all the people and not just a segment of the people. So like I said, the film was very emotional, but it also gave me hope. I'm at the end, the way it ended where change was made. And I hope that we continue to move toward the hope side 
and just remember that we're all in this together. Now, panelists, if Rosa were with us today, what do you think she would say about America? Would she have positive things to say? What other negative things that she would say? What would she have to say to us today? Uh, Karen, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I guess like um, myself and many people, most of us probably, it's, this is, she would probably be a mixture of both, <laughs> of both shock, horror, and, um, and really pleased, really pleased because both really positive, um, strong things are happening, I think right now. And um, also um, what just happened and what, what we still go through, um, what we saw this year and what we've seen again, this new era of killing, killing of black people and, um, and still people not understanding, you know, equating black lives black matter, lives with, matter with, with, uh, with uh, something happened, something to happened to me. Audio, audio. Can yeah, you? We can can you, you. Yeah, hear. we can hear you. Okay, okay. I just have a big I, from where I'm at. I'll try and fix it in a minute. But yeah, I think she would see, find both um, a, a very encouraging and also very serious um, because we're that's where we're at. Yeah, yeah. Anderson, what would Rosa say to you? Yeah. I, I concur completely with Karen. I think she would be happy that we've come this far, but she would also acknowledge that we have not come far enough. Mm -hmm. um, and she would say, we take one giant step forward and then two small steps back. Yeah. But on balance, she would say that, that these are better times than they were way back when. And people who say, for example, nothing has changed she would say, you weren't there. A lot has changed. A lot more needs to be changed, but we can't stop now. And I think on balance, her approach would be to remind us, to tell us that you have no right to stop. You can't stop. Don't even think of stopping because you, there's still work to be done. But I think on balance, she'd say that America has come a, a good long ways from where we were the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Yeah. Jefferson, is Jefferson, are you there? Jefferson, what do you uh, think? Yes. How would Rosa Parks react to the current scene in America today? What would she think of what's going on right now? Okay, I wanted to share my screen with my answers, but um, all right, let me just read it off. Can you oh. still hear me, right? Sure, yes, we can hear you. Okay, that's good. So honestly, she'll be proud of the peaceful protesters today in America. There are many young adults and students that are protesting to help bring awareness to systematic oppression. Other countries are protesting as well, such as Canada, the UK, and certain parts of Africa. Police brutality is a major issue surrounding America, but that is only a small portion of systematic racism, the workplace, health facilities, housing, education and the justice system especially are racially biased towards African-Americans. Despite the majority of peaceful protests, there have been riots which, which, which defeats the agenda of peaceful protests. Small businesses have been burned down and people have broken into stores such as Gucci to sell merchandise. The majority of small business owners do not have insurance and it is devastating to have one's business burned to the ground after years of building it. Black owned businesses in particular and specifically have a difficult time obtaining loans from the banks to open up a business first and foremost. And this a business owners shouldn't be targeted as they are people who had nothing to do with police brutality. So essentially she'll be proud for the most part, but we have came a long way to pick it back off what um, others have said in this, in this uh, meeting. And also I want to say, um, I want to say what else? We still have work to do, and, and yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Uh, Victor, your thoughts? On mute.
Victor, can you unmute? Oh. Unmute. Oh, is it there you go. Now? Yeah. What I'm, you know, thinking is that she would see the injustices uh, by the police is still alarming. There is a systemic uh, bias and discrimination still that the white supremacists are still there. And it is the, you know, second generation. You know, they're not the same that were there in the 60s. So it has percolated down. Why it is that, that has to be uh, figured out. And uh, uh, the hatred is still there in their heart. Why is it so? And there are a lot of reasons that uh, together foster that enmity. So what do we do? Do we, you know, what do we do? Just by laws, you know, what is the outreach that we can do? What are some of, uh, uh, you know, their problems, their identity, who's molding them? We saw recently just by, um, you know, one person, the president, and the interest, vested interest groups, how they have been able to mold, mold 70 million people to their side, which is very, very, very alarming. Mm -hmm. You know, how is it do that done? What have we done to reach that group? You know, when we talk about that, you know, reaching that group, it is always seems to be that they will never turn around. They will never turn around. So if that is so, then what is the mechanism to do that? How can we approach that? So that has to be considered and figured out. Uh, you know, the president who's reaching out to those people through the pastors, through the churches, their churches, whoever churches, that needs to reach out to them and their sense of insecurity, their sense of hatred. Uh, why has it percolated down to the second generation? And then it'll percolate to the third generation. Uh, what are we going to do? Um, but again, she would be happy that some strides have been made yeah. from the public, uh, you know, uh, public, uh, the public uh, pain that uh, was happening during a time, it is very less. We have seen that now we had the first African-American president. A lot of African-American, um, you know, leaders are there that are mobilizing and galvanizing the people. Another thing that has to happen, which is the interfaith that we are doing, you know, through the interfaith, Gandhi did that. In a way, of course, he was not successful. At the end, you know, there were there were riots and there were killings, but he initiated it by having uh, daily prayers where all the people from the interfaith used to come in, and all the positive aspects of the religion and faith was brought out, and uh, the political movement was galvanized. So, you know, uh, that is something that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. And finally, panelists, any, oh, I'm, Rhonda, your thought. <laughs> Don't forget me. Don't forget I won't me. forget you, Rhonda. No, I, I do have thoughts about this. I mean, I think she would feel um, mixed emotions, as many of us do, as we mentioned here on the call, that yes, we have gone forward, but as we can see in this day and age, that there's a lot of factors that's pulling us back to the old days. Yes. And that rhetoric that we talk about in those groups is coming back up and trying to do those same interrogation tactics and everything. But what I am excited about and what I am looking forward to is what Jefferson mentioned is how the young people have been there. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned earlier, I've been in so many uh, peaceful protests as well. And it was great to see not only the young folks, but also people, uh, white, white folks walking with me and walking along with us. And it was peaceful and that we just really wanted our voices heard. I mean, eight minutes, what was it? Eight minutes, almost nine minutes to be kneeling on somebody's neck I tried to do that at a march in Rivera Beach and I was exhausted. I have no idea how he was able to do that for that long because I couldn't even just kneel without putting my name, my, um, 
knee on somebody's neck for that long of a time. So like I said, I do see some positive, but we do have a long way to go. I'm very excited about our first um, president-elect, uh, Kamala, uh, coming aboard, who happens to be a sorority sister of uh, Rosa Parks. She's also a part of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. And so, you know, we have come together. That's not my particular sorority, but we have come together as Greeks, as Divine Nine, to stand together to say that we need change. And we did get, I'm proud to say that we did get um, mobilized and we did get around uh, President Biden and some of his things. But you thought, how do we have to come to where a previous president had to talk bad about a former, a current president? That never happened. And that really hurt President Obama to have to come out and really state some of the things that he said. And look at how many days have we been here now with after post-election and our current president has still not succeeded the, the race. And we're still in turmoil. And he's still talking about that same rhetoric. So those are the type of things that I think Rosa Parks would continue to be disappointed in. But I do think just like President Obama and other uh, uh, other leaders who come around and say, you, you have to step up and have to say enough is enough. And so I charge anybody out there that is part of the Republic Party that can do or can say anything to affect change. We have to come together. The election is over. Now, how can we come together? And I think that is exactly what Rosa Parks would want to see us do in order for her legacy and all our legacies to continue on. We have to come together and put some of these differences aside because as he mentioned, 70 million folks voted for some of that rhetoric and it, it's just ridiculous. So that just means we're not on the same page and that there's a lot of still hate and it's colorism. You know, what, what could possibly be so wrong with just having a different color of skin with someone? Wise word. Thank you. Thank you. Now, all of you, if you have any parting thoughts, any personal reflections on this uh, this anniversary, any personal experiences that are relevant that you would like to share, um, Karen. Um. Yeah. I mean, I I, I would. I'm just going to share that I I am very encouraged with um, the pe people that Biden is choosing for his cabinet very encouraged. Mm -hmm. I mean, it started out great with Kamala Harris, um, but it just seems to get better. And um, I mean, he's really courageous in what he's doing. And I, um, I think it was just today, I noticed um, in what well, for the economic team, um, the, um, the economic team, I don't know what they call that, but um, he chose a young, uh, young man who, who's, whose parents, I think his parents were from Ghana, that we've never had this before. And um, I was very happy to see um, my old, uh, 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 an old friend of mine from the 90s, Jared Bernstein on the ticket. And he's, uh, he's always been a fighter and um, so I just think it's, I'm very, very encouraged uh, with, with what Biden is doing. And I'm really looking forward to, um, to what this is gonna look like and fighting, continuing to fight for, for this. Um, you know, his Exciting. Time. Yeah, very Exciting time. time. Yeah. And Anderson, your thoughts? Yeah, my thoughts basically are that we have been through four years of darkness Mm -hmm. And the darkness was was very, very dark. And I think sometimes a lot of us wondered, how did we go from where we were to where we are now? Mm -hmm. But I do believe firmly that when I think of Donald Trump, with all the negatives, what I'm proud to say is that Donald Trump caused more Blacks to vote than any other president in history. And that's a positive. That's a major positive. More Blacks voted in this election than voted for Obama in the last election. That's a trend, if we keep it going, can gain us miles before we sleep. And I'm counting on that happening. Thank you. Jefferson, any final thoughts from you? Uh, yes, I wanted to touch on Rhonda's point and um, so on. So the colorism within our community. So I watch a lot of YouTube videos on pro-blackness. And when you think of pro-blackness to its entirety, you know, 
you consider all aspects, all systems that are against that oppressive black people. So the colorism, the, the self-hatred, the, of course, systematic racism and so forth, um, it does exist. And of course, I was watching this one video that, um, that, that question, you know, interracial dating, you know, can you be pro-black and marry outside your race? I understand the concept of pro-blackness, but however, even today, I understand what black women specifically are talking about when it comes to colorism. And honestly, for black daughters, as they grow older, it is, you know, it's best that they consider dating outside their race. I'm not saying you can't find a decent, good black man. What I'm saying is because of the Eurocentric standards, the television shows, the programming and whatnot, you know, it has really caused self-hatred, but then of course, racism as well into our black girls and even other communities, the Asians of the world, Indians, darker skinned people within a community, within a ethnic group. So how pro-black are some of these pro-black men who claim to be pro-black, but they, you know, disregard their counterparts and whatnot. And so, and that's why I wanted to really touch on. And that's for Donald Trump. I, um, what I've realized with this election, yes, we finally get a break from Donald Trump's um, antics. But at the same time, I remind myself, regardless of the next white ruler, I am in charge of my future, no matter what. Um, and so I just continue to work, work every day at, um, you know, at my, on my studies and whatnot. And yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Um, Victor, your final thought? Yes, I would just say that, uh, you know, I was very anxious uh, before the results came out, uh, but it was like I, I could breathe again. And so was my family. You know, we are Indian Americans, Hindus. Um, my kids were born here and, you know, their friends are all together, you know, and that was very promising to see how they are American, you know, mm -hmm. their, uh, the baggage of the elders is not there with them. They are adopting and uh, including the, uh, the norms and the values of uh, the American society. So if I, it has to do with any issue, uh, will Kamala Harris support Kashmir or not, was not their problem. They, they were more concerned with what is good for America, what is good for the plight of the African Americans and what is the plight of uh, the people. So that was very promising, but my anxiety is still there that there are a lot of people, 70 million people, and they have hatred. Some mechanisms have to be developed. Yes, we can ride the wave. You know, we could never, I could never expect that this would come around, that through the mechanisms of Russia, fascism, the mechanisms that a whole group uh, historical uh, could be taken advantage of and converted into a rage that happened. So my thing is, how do we um, counter that? You know, so we need to develop uh, uh, systems and an effort has to be made how we can change the police, the, you know, the laws, the policies, but it has to be approached also uh, from society, you know, how to do that, you know, so that's, that's, uh, but it's encouraging, like Karen said, we have very good uh, people, young people, who are, uh, you know, not biased. Uh, they are open. They are universalists. And those people are coming in. And, um, you know, I just saw that 
a lady by the name of Neera Tandon, who has Indian origin. She's been, she's been taken into the economic, uh, on a budget, you know, budget uh, head of uh, Biden. So there are people that are coming in. So it's encouraging and, you know, let's support, you know, uh, what Rhonda was saying about, uh, let's get involved. You know, I was involved with three elections of state representatives, they all won. I was involved with the Broward counties, two school board members, new board members, you know, funded them, you know, like uh, did fundraising and, uh, you know, all that brought them in. So my hard efforts is to how to mobilize our young people, you know, different ethnic groups, how to mobilize them to be part of the civic engagement. So there's a positivity there. Thank you, Victor. Rhonda, your final thought? Yeah, I just want to remind us that diversity is going to be key. I think Karen started us out with that whole conversation. And we have to just remember, just like this panel, we're very diverse with age, gender, uh, race, and, uh, and everything. And so we just have to remember that we are all um, American citizens and that we diversity is going to be key in collaboration. I just hope that he continues to build a strong um, administration. Um, as we can see from young and, and, and seasoned folks, as well as uh, different races and things like that. So my whole, whole thing is let's just kind of work together, collaborate, and the diversity is the key because America is already a melting pot. And so we might as well embrace that diversity and, and move forward together. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any questions in the chat, but I do see some very nice comments and uh, some very positive mentions of our panelists and their wise words. Uh, I just, I want to do just a little tiny short commercial for our listeners, which is that if you would like to sign up for our Lake Worth Interface Network newsletter, you can just give us your email in the chat. Uh, you can check out our website. It's lwinterface.net. And you can find all of our activities like this one. If you would like to join us, we'd love to have you. Um, and I have one little parting gift for you. This is a recipe. Yeah. And it's a recipe that was found in the papers of Rosa Parks. This is her recipe for pancakes. Oh, wow. So if you really want to celebrate and honor her, I would be happy to share this recipe with you. Oh, it's, and, uh, it's on the screen, so yes, I see. Yeah, it's kind of hard to read, but if you would like to have it, I would be happy to email it to you. I yes. can tell you that I have tried it, and it's delicious, and the secret ingredient is peanut butter. I saw that. I'm like, did that say peanut butter? I'm like, wow, that's cool. Yes. They're really good. They're very light and fluffy. Well, I do want to encourage anyone who has not been to Montgomery to see our statue. I had the privilege of taking a busload of 55 women and men to the 55th anniversary of the Bloody Sunday. And while we were there on the bus tour, we got a chance to um, go to the lynching museums and really get dove into the history. But a group of us did go and take a picture with the, the new statue. I think it's what, about uh, two years old maybe now, yeah. right there in Montgomery. So it, it is beautiful. And it was very beautiful around the scenery and the waterfalls and everything that they have near near her statue right there at that bus stop, the infamous bus stop. It must have been stop. very powerful for you. It was wonderful. It was just before we all shut down on COVID. We were there yeah. Sunday, March 1st. And I would just mention that uh, my wife uh, is from Montgomery. Uh, we started there and uh, we were married in uh, the convention center at the, at the uh, in Montgomery itself, and uh, we went to the church. And my father-in-law was, uh, you know, associated uh, with the movement. You know, he was there in the 60s. He was a professor in one of the colleges. So I have very fond memories of uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Panelists, thank you. We appreciate you so much. Thank you for being with us. Good thank night. You. Thank you. Good night. Before you go, look who's here. Good oh. night. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hi, Rosa. Thank you so very much. I'm very happy to be here. This is a wonderful evening.